Well, hey, I don't want to take any more time. We've got some very special guests here. And uh, we, have, we have Dr. Morocco and Pastor Colleen Morocco that are visiting here with us. Y'all give them a hand clap for, for being here. And come on up here, Doc. Let me say just uh, one thing about, about Doc has been such a blessing in my life and Jesse's life. We met him, uh, I don't know, five, six years ago. Met him in Korea, Seoul, Korea. He was preaching at the largest church in the world whenever I met him there. Now, I met him in the gym. We were up early in the morning working out. We were getting after it. And uh, uh, we, we kind of hit it off. And Doc, uh, a lot of you know him. He's preached here many times now. But Doc, God's used him to literally change the state of Hawaii. And not just the state of Hawaii, also the world. The church he represents now now is one church in over 275 locations. Come on, somebody. Talking about supernatural. Um, one of the most, in my estimation, one of the most powerful apostles on the planet today. Come on, let's give him one more big hand clap. I love you. Well, hallelujah. Well, you gotta, you gotta welcome me with the Hawaiian way. Aloha. What a joy to be with you. My beautiful wife's here. Sweetheart, would you stand and uh, wave to everybody? I enjoy traveling with her. I tell you what, it's awesome. And we sure enjoy your pastors. I mean, when, when your pastors come to be with us on Maui, we just want to kidnap them and keep them. But, you know, they won't let us do that. But... They were there recently and did a great, great job. And I tell you what, God has blessed you. All right, let me try it one more time. I said, God has blessed you with great pastors. Amen. Amen. Can you hear me okay? All right. Well, listen, stand to your feet. Let's get into the Word. If you can get a little bit more light here so I can read. I'm getting old. You know that, don't you? So... But I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis. I'm, um, it's always a joy to be with you. And there's a table in the back. If you haven't had a chance to pick up some of the things the Lord has allowed me to write, they'll bless you. I did my doctoral dissertation on demons. So if you're interested in trying to find out how to cast them out, how to live free of them and all of that, there's a number of books back there on the subject and book on revival and my wife even wrote a little book called life is like a garden hose it's a great book and uh, just wonderful things back there you might want to stop by and take a look i want you to turn to genesis 28 tonight We've got a special <coughs> excuse me <coughs> all this traveling's getting to me here genesis 28 verses 12 through 22 and let's read the word of the lord together Genesis 28, verse 12 through 22. Here's what it says. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth and its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out into the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Everybody say blessed. blessed. Through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land and I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed upon his head set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on my journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, 
then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Wow. Now turn with me to Genesis 35. Genesis 35. I want you to read verse 1. Then God said to Jacob, Go up to Bethel and settle there, and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. And I shoot on down to verse 11. And God said to him, I am almighty God. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I give, gave to Abraham and Isaac, I give to you. I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at that place where he had talked with him. And Jacob set up a pillar at the place God had talked with him. And he poured out a drink offering on it. He also poured oil on it. And Jacob called the place where God had talked with him Bethel. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this great church the tremendous leadership you have given this church. I thank you for what you're doing in this city. Come on, people, let's just pray in the Holy Ghost. Spirit of the living God, come upon me in power tonight. I desperately need your anointing because there's yokes that need to be broken and it's your anointing that breaks yokes. It's not simply a message that will make the difference. It's your spirit working through that message to change hearts. So Holy Ghost, come. Come upon me. Come upon this congregation. Give us ears to hear, a heart to respond, and eyes to see. And when we leave, may we leave knowing we've heard your word and our lives have been changed. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. At the beginning of every year, I seek the Lord for a word, not only for my church, but for churches that I may minister in that year. And God gave me a word. It was a profound word. One word, multiply. Everybody say multiply. I became consumed by that word, and I began to search the scriptures to see where that word is at. And I want to talk about that tonight, because that word multiply is tied to God's blessing. Everybody say it with me. Multiply is tied to God's blessing. So I want all of you to say this. Are you ready? I am blessed and I will multiply. Say it again. I am blessed and I will multiply. It's got to get in your spirit. You notice over and over again in scriptures that that's the case. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, Verse 26, you'll notice that God blessed Abraham and he said, be fruitful and multiply. Genesis 1, 28. You'll notice in Genesis 9, 1, he talks to Noah. And again in Genesis 9, 7, he blessed Noah and his son saying, be fruitful and multiply. In verse 7, he says, as for you, be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. He blessed Abraham. And you'll notice that he mentioned that Abraham would be so blessed that those who bless Abraham would be blessed and those who cursed him would be cursed. He even goes on to say that the whole world would be blessed through Abraham. And he goes on in Genesis 13 and he mentions to Abraham not only how he would give him Canaan's land, but he would multiply him in such a way that his children would be like the dust of the earth if you could count the dust. In fact, in Genesis 15, he continues with that theme of multiplication. When he takes Abraham outside and he says, look at the stars, you're going to have more children than those stars. Everybody say multiply. Abraham's now 99 years old. And in Genesis 17, verses 1 and 2, God said, I'm almighty God, or I'm El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will confirm my covenant between me and you and will multiply thee. Wow. The promise to Abraham extended to 
his two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, there in Genesis 17, 20 and Genesis 26, 4. You see, when God blesses you, there is a response. It's multiplication. In fact, this is seen very, very clearly in the life of the person we read about tonight. His name was Jacob. You notice that Jacob was born in a dysfunctional family. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand to identify with Jacob here, but there are a lot of people that use their dysfunctional family as a way of saying, well, I, I can't be blessed. I, I can't multiply. has nothing to do with how cool you are. has nothing to do with what your parents did. It has everything to do whether the blessing of God is on your life. And you'll notice this so clearly with Jacob. Jacob is fleeing from his home. The reason is, is that Jacob was a scam artist and and it's fascinating to me that Jacob scammed his brother out of his birthright and out of his blessing. And his brother Esau got so angry, he said, I'm going to kill the boy. And his parents, his mom especially, believed it. So his mom worked out a little scenario to get her son out of town. She said to her husband, Isaac, he said, look, Isaac, I don't want my son marrying any of the women around this place like Esau did. I want him to marry people from our family. So I, I, you need to send him over to Laban, my brother's house. It was really a way to get him out of town, but it sounded good, so off Jacob went. But you'll notice something. When Jacob left, he left with absolutely nothing, just the clothes on his back and a staff in his hand. He had nothing. He didn't really even know what was about to happen to him or how it would even go. He was fleeing for his life. But you'll notice in the text that we read, he comes to a place. In fact, it happened to be the very same place that Abraham had met God, Bethel. And he's resting there in this place. And all of a sudden, he has a dream and in this dream, God reveals himself to him. And God blesses Jacob. It's a most amazing story that at that moment, he encounters God and he encounters God as the God who blesses. And God says, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to bless you. Well, we read the story then in Genesis 35 that he comes full circle He's been at Bethel. He goes to Laban's house. He, he spends 14 years working for his wives, six years to get flocks, and he comes all the way back to Bethel. And there God reveals himself again. And it is there that we see that God blessed Jacob way beyond anyone's understanding because when he comes back, it makes it clear in verse 13, Verse 43 of Genesis 30, it says, Jacob grew exceedingly prosperous and came to own large flocks and maid servants and men servants and camels and donkeys. In that 20 year time, he went from having absolutely nothing to having wealth, great wealth. You say, Well, what happened? One thing happened. It was the blessing of God on his life that produced multiplication. Somebody say hallelujah. But when you think about this concept of be fruitful and multiply, you'll notice something. That multiplication is not only the response or the result of blessing, it is a command that goes with the blessing. In other words, God commands us to multiply. Now, let me see if I can explain this to you. It is God does his part, blesses us, but he calls on us to do our part. And you say, well, Pastor Morocco, what is our part? Well, we see that in the life of Jacob. The first thing you'll notice about Jacob is there at Bethel, he came into covenant with God. Everybody say covenant. He makes a covenant with him. 
he literally sets up an altar, the stone he slept on, and he pours oil on, anoints it, and he makes covenant with God. You say, well, how do we know we made covenant with God? It's because of what he says. He says, if you will do what you said, God, I will be a tither. Now think about this for a moment. I, I, I want to slap some people sometimes. I don't know about you, but that's the Italian coming out of me. I'm, I'm telling you what. It's the mafiosa. I want to slap some people. It's because you got some stupid people that say, well, I don't believe in tithing because tithing's in the Old Testament. It's in part of the law, and I'm under grace and not the law. Tithing was not even, the law hadn't even been given yet when Jacob tithed. Listen to me, it wouldn't come till almost 600 years later. And not only did Jacob tithe, but Abraham tithe without any law. So what in the world's going on there? I'll tell you what it is. They understood the concept of covenant, which we don't understand. When you come into covenant with God, you give your life to him. Your money is only a reflection of your life. It's the sum total of your time talent that you put in and you, and you, and, and, and you, uh, you, you say, I'm going to return part of my life to God. That's what tithing is. And Jacob instinctively knew that without a law. Abraham knew it as well. It's only the dumb folk of our generation that don't understand covenant. Before you'll ever know the blessing of God, you've got to establish covenant with him. You need to say, Jesus, you're my Savior, my Lord. I give you my heart, my life. And then you express that. You express your faith by a covenant act. So everybody say covenant. There are a lot of people who want to be blessed, but they never come into covenant with God. And what they want is God to bless what they're doing. They got their own agenda. And if God don't bless them like they want to get blessed, they say, I'm leaving. What kind of nonsense is that? You start with covenant. Everybody say covenant. And secondly, you got to look at what happens to Jacob. You'll notice this in Genesis 35. Jacob had some sons that, that did some real bad things. And the result of those bad things was that the entire area where they were living, Jacob and his family thought they were going to team up together and kill the entire family, Jacob and his family. They had every right to do that. They were outnumbered huge. But there's something that Jacob said to his sons and his family there in verse 22. He said, look, he said, get rid of the idols. Now let me talk to you a moment. When God blessed Abraham there in Genesis 7, 17, he said, look, walk before me and be blameless. That is, part of being excuse me, under the blessing of God is to live a life that reflects God in the world. I wrote a book back there. If you've not read it, you need to. It's called Defiled. It's Satan's assault to destroy you and to destroy me and to destroy the church. Now listen to me. There has to be a conscious sense of repentance in our life. Don't wait a long time to repent. Don't wait till all the world collapses around you before you decide to repent. You repent quickly. Now, you men know this in a marriage. If your wife hollers at you and she's got a point, you don't just sit there and defend yourself. Well, you do if you're dumb. <laughs> but if you're smart, you'll repent quick. Ladies, you know the same, the same rules for you. And it's the same rule with God. You see, when we hide our sin, we, we allow a hook in our lives.
for the enemy to manipulate us. Just like there's, I, you know, I've done, I did a doctorate in counseling and marriage and family counseling and Christian counseling. And, and I used to counsel a lot in my early days of ministry. I don't do it much anymore. But I found very clearly that oftentimes the problems in marriage is just that people are so proud that they aren't willing to be transparent and repent of things they've done wrong. Smile at me. I'm preaching good. Come on, guys. Help me out. It's Wednesday night. So the second thing, first come into covenant. Second, live a holy life. Be blameless. Get rid of every defilement. You got some secret sin? Come on. Get rid of it. God, God can take care of that if you just bring it out in the open and ask God to heal it. Come on. Somebody say amen. Amen. I've seen it time and time again. My wife began a ministry to drug addicts and alcoholics, and she'd never taken drugs or alcohol. And I said to her, how are you going to do that? You don't know a thing about it. She said, I don't know, but God said, this is what I'm supposed to do. And one of the most amazing things happened is that she, uh, God spoke to her and said, I've got people in the church that I've set free. They're going to help you. And do you know that's exactly what happened? That's exactly what happened. And today, hundreds and hundreds of people have been impacted, freeing themselves of things that would defile them. Come on, somebody say hallelujah. (laughs) Thirdly, thirdly, be a worshiper. Everybody say be a worshiper. Now, you'll notice that in Old Testament times, space was important. You know that. There were sacred spaces like Bethel. I mean, Abraham was there, Jacob was there, there were sacred spaces. Now, we don't, we don't think in terms of sacred spaces today because God doesn't dwell in buildings made by hand. We know that. He dwells within the human heart. But there is something that happens, Paul writes, that when the church gathers like we're gathered tonight, there's a unique working of the Holy Ghost that is very, very real. And so literally what happens when we gather like this, this place becomes a sacred place because the church itself has gathered and the power of the Holy Ghost is present. Now that says to me something. It says to me why the writer of Hebrews would say, do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves as the manner of some is. In fact, he goes on, he says, as you see the day approaching, he says, all the more as you see the world disintegrate around you, you must, you must, Create, if you will, that altar, that sacred place, that, that, that being a part and committed to a local church. Be a worshiper where you put it on the calendar. I'm going to be in church every Sunday morning. I'm going to be in church on Wednesday night. I, I'm going to go to Bethel. It's got to be there in your life. You know, as a young man, 17 years old, I shared a story a while back on the goodness of God and how God revealed his goodness to me. But let me remind you, as a 17-year-old boy, I worked myself across from, on a freighter from the Philippines to the United States to go to college. And I, I got on board a ship of, of perverts. I had guys who had VD 12 times. I mean... They, all they did when they stopped at a port would, would be to, to, to get drunk and fornicate, and that was it. And I hear I'm a young guy, 17 years old, loving God on board that ship, and I could have easily gone the way of the crowd. But every time I landed at a port, the deepest desire of my heart was to find a church. I landed in Vietnam. I'll never forget it. I landed in Vietnam, in Quang Nam, Vietnam, the height of the Vietnam War. Our ship was unloading cargo in the Vietnam War. And I remember clearly you had to take a little boat from the ship to the harbor. It was night and it was raining, but it was a Wednesday night, and I felt like I have to be in church. I hitchhiked on an American Jeep that went to a chaplaincy. I sat in the back, a 17-year-old boy, dripping wet, cold listening to a preacher preach, but I was, I was at Bethel. I, I, I left that, that night, I, I hitchhiked back to the pier only to find out 
that the ship, the little boat I got on was no longer going to go anymore because there was sniper fire. I'm a 17-year-old kid in the middle of a war zone. I got there because I wanted to be in church. And I remember I had no place to go, and I saw a hut, dirt floor. There was a desk in that little hut. I crawled under that desk and prayed, Oh, God, allow me to see the morning. And he did. Ship had a hole in it in Japan. First thing I did was to try to find a church. I'll never forget it. I, I asked somebody, I said, is there a church here in Yokohama, Japan? And, and he said, well, he said, he looked up in a telephone directory. That's when we had telephone directories. And uh, he found an address and he told the, he told the taxi driver to take him. Well, I didn't know it. It was on the other side of the city. I used every dime I had just to get to that church. I got to that church, and it was a Japanese church. There were about 20 to 30 people there sitting on the floor. It was all in Japanese. And I, I got in there, and I was in church. I was at Bethel. I was worshiping God. I didn't understand a word they said. But when we took communion, oh, my, 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 my. Something's got to happen to our generation. It's got to happen. A yearning to worship God. To say, I am going to be a part of God's house, Bethel. Whew. Excuse me for getting so excited, but I, I just can't handle it when people just are very nonchalant about what you're doing tonight. You'll not know the blessing of God unless you're a worshiper. That brings me then to the fourth thing. Are you still with me? And that is, look, obedient to God's word. God spoke to Jacob to go back to his father and to his relatives, and he said, I will be with you. Now, <laughs> you say... Oh, that's great. He gets to go home. Uh, there was somebody waiting for him at home. Now, understand this. I mean, you know, you got to think this through. Jacob's going back to the boy who's wanting to kill him. And if you think that he had forgiven him, explain to me why Esau came to meet Jacob with 400 men. You don't go meeting somebody with 400 armed men unless you're going to do war. That boy's days were numbered, yet he obeyed God. And even in his obedience, he offended his father, who wanted to kill him as well. Sometimes it's hard to obey God. I go back to what my wife did. You know how she ended up, it's, it's most amazing, she's sitting on the front row and, 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 and we have a little thing that we do before the tithe and offering. It's our daily seed. We, it's giving to our building fund. And she's sitting on the front row on a Sunday night, and a young man walked in front of her, and the Holy Spirit said, ask him to help you. He put some money in, and so as he was walking back, Colin grabbed him and said, would you help me? I'm starting a ministry called Transformation. She didn't know it, but he was a drunk. We couldn't figure out why he'd come to church every once in a while. It's because he was drunk for two or three months. Very difficult. He had a rough time. He loved the Lord, but he just couldn't handle it. When she said, would you help me? He said, yes, I'll help you. He came. Did you know what God did? Because he served, God delivered him from his alcohol. Today... He's one of the ministers on my staff leading one of my extensions and leading transformation ministries. Somebody say hallelujah. I don't care how hard it is. If you'll obey the Lord, the Lord will always make a way where there is no way because of the blessing of God on your life. That brings me to the fifth thing, and that is pray. Everybody say pray. Yes, we need to make covenant. We need to stay free of defilement. We need to be a worshiper. We need to be obedient. But fifth thing is to pray. And in Genesis 32, 9, 
you'll he see the prayer of Jacob. And oh, did he pray. Wow, what a prayer. Oh, God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, oh, Lord, who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. I'll multiply. He's, he's reminding God what God said. I'm unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I only had my staff when I crossed the Jordan, but now I have become two groups. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I'm afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. He's praying. Sometimes we don't realize the power of prayer, and that's why we don't pray a lot. The reason I can stand here before you and preach is because on Maui, there's a whole congregation of people praying for me. I cannot call my office without numbers of people saying, we're praying for you, Pastor. We're praying for you. every morning from 5.30 to 6.30. Every morning in all of our locations, there's a prayer meeting, and one of the people they pray for is me. I never take it lightly because it's that prayer meeting that has brought us through incredible challenges. You don't pastor one church in 275 locations. We're in seven building programs. We just bought two more buildings, one in Branson and one in Cleburne, Texas. I need millions. At any moment, the whole thing could collapse. If you're not praying, friend, I don't know what you're doing, but you ain't doing it right. You ain't going to make it on your good looks. You're not going to make it on your charismatic char you know, a personality. It's the one who prays and seeks God regularly that will make it. Because God's blessing rests on that one. Somebody say amen. That brings me to the sixth thing. Are you still with me? Don't worry about it. I'm not going to have 21 points like a friend of mine had. I was hoping he'd stop at three. Only got seven. You'll notice that he persevered and God gave him a new name and transformed his life. You read about it at Genesis 32. When, when Jacob was spending the night alone before he was to meet Esau, and um, <clears throat> he wrestled with a man. When you look at it closely, you realize this man was either an angel or a theophany. Theophany is an appearance of God in the Old Testament. I believe he wrestled with Jesus. And at that moment, he said, I will not let you go till you bless me. And the one he wrestled with blessed him and changed his name. It happened because he persevered. You know, just recently, about a month ago, a couple in my church, precious couple, came to me and told me an incredible story. They've always been one of the good givers in my church. Back in 2009, they had bought a home. I think they'd lived in the home for about four years. And about 2009, when the economy crashed, they lost their home. It was foreclosed upon. Think about this couple. They didn't get bitter. They didn't, uh, they didn't scream at God. They didn't stop tithing. They continued to persevere in their ministries, persevere in their giving, persevere in loving God, serving God. Their business had fallen, but they didn't stop persevering in God. Well, about a month ago, he began to share with me some things. He shared with me how during that period of time, God gave him new businesses, in fact, the current business he has is prospering him so greatly, way beyond anything he'd ever had. But something unusual that I had never heard ever happen, happened. He said after the house was foreclosed on, he got these letters from lawyers mentioning to him how the foreclosure was illegal. And this one lawyer continued to pursue it. And um, they thought it was kind of a sham. You know, they didn't think it was a scam or something. They didn't know. But, you know, this guy kept pursuing them. Well, about a month ago, come to find out, this lawyer had sued the bank and uh, informed them 
that they were going to get back $105,000. And about three weeks ago, he said, Pastor, I got the check. And I shouted with them because they were tithers. Hallelujah. Have you ever heard of any bank ever having to pay somebody for foreclosing on them? That was a God thing because they persevered. Some people never get into the multiplication because they give up on God too early. Are you still with me? That brings me then to the seventh thing. Listen up. Oh, my, 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 my. Oh, this is good. Are you ready for the seventh point? What was the first one? Covenant. What was the second one? Stay free of defilement. What's the third? Be a worshiper. What's the fourth? Be obedient. I know you've memorized it all. The fifth was pray. The sixth was persevere. And here's the seventh. Work hard. Well, that went over real big. Let me try it one more time. Work hard. Genesis 31, 6. Jacob says these words, you know that I've worked for your father with all my strength, yet your father has cheated me and changed my wages ten times. However, God has not allowed him to harm me. Those seven things. God will do his part. We do our part. But one of the things about what God demands of us is faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. You know that and I know that. And so sometimes what happens for us, we don't stand in faith. We, we, we get fearful. We, we, we begin to think somehow it's not going to happen. Everything's going to collapse. Stop it already. Get it in your spirit. I am blessed. I will multiply. I want some people who believe that with me to say it on three. Ready? One, two, three. I am blessed and I will multiply. If you'll get that thing in your spirit, everything will change. I'm telling you, it will change. When I announced this at the beginning of this year, we began to say it as a church. In fact, I made some, we had some T-shirts made with the sign, I am blessed and I will multiply. And my people wear it. And when we gather, in fact, all of my life groups, well, let me tell you something about this. We have small groups on Maui. Now, I pastor the whole state of Hawaii and many, many places, many nations, 14 other states and 14 other nations. But I'm going to tell you what, just on Maui alone, we're getting up to almost 700 small groups meeting every week. Somebody say, Hallelujah. Things have begun to multiply. Financially, we've begun to multiply. Things have changed dramatically. It is amazing. The moment you believe, the moment you believe, everything changes. God wants you to stand in faith. Let me give you a little help on standing in faith. Are you aware of the fact that even though God spoke to the patriarchs that he would multiply them, their wives were all barren? Abraham's wife Sarai was barren. Isaac's wife Rebecca was barren. Jacob's wife Rachel was barren. And yet out of that barrenness, God did a miracle and turned it around and they multiplied. Don't you allow your barrenness to be the defining moment of God's blessing. God's blessing is the key ingredient and you will multiply. You'll notice, for example, that Jacob was so convinced of the multiplication of God that he did something so strange he took, you know, Laban had taken all of the sheep and goats that were spotted and speckled, and he, he put them aside, and he said, your, your salary is going to be all the speckled and spotted sheep and goats. Well, the only problem is he only had full-colored goats and sheep. So he takes a little stick, and you know the story there in Genesis, and he peels part of the bark, sticks it in the watering troughs, and he said, look, when, when, when they come to drink and they... 
and, and they come to mate, they're going to look at these sticks and they're going to have these sheep and goats that are spotted and speckled. And we all look at that and go, that is the dumbest thing I have ever heard. Don't you know anything about genetics, Jacob? Had nothing to do with genetics. Had everything to do with faith. That was his declaration of faith. That was his hope, those sticks, and God honored it. Friend, listen, God will honor your faith. Are you still with me? You'll notice very clearly that that's why we need to be people that remember what God has done in the past so that he can do even more things for us today. Time and time again, I face financial pressures that were literally, you know, I, I, all I can say is I buckled on my knees and overwhelmed. I felt like a weight was on me. Never forget a moment when God said, get up. Get in your car. And I drove over to, to our skating rink, our first major building, realizing we had no money to buy it or be in it, and God provided. And he took me over to the original chapel that we'd rebuilt, and I had no money to do it, and, and God redid it. Then I drove back to the cathedral, and there sitting on that corner is a $50 million building, and God did it, and it's all paid for. And once I began to just remember what God had done, Faith began to come and well up in my heart. Wow. And finally, praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love what it says in Psalm 113. He settles the barren woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. I don't know what you're going through. But I came tonight with a word that this year, if you believe it, will be your year of multiplication. 